you find me this morning with a quite a different backdrop. If you have joined in any of our virtual today services, you've perhaps seen my altar area. This is the altar that I have in my home, in the corner of my bedroom. And for this morning's discussion of the church within, as much as I tried to share the idea of the church within on a intellectual level and with words, when I was at the chapel this week, I found myself continuing to get stuck. The words that were coming out of my mouth kept feeling kind of trivial and meaningless next to the reality of our, of our inner life and of our inner connection to God which Swedenborg describes using the same term that we use for um, the buildings within which we worship as a, a church, the church within. And so I thought it would be appropriate to speak to you from a representation of, of my church within. You know, I think it's probably always been true that human beings have had a, a bigger spiritual life than what they have been able to bring or express within the confines of a religious tradition. I'm guessing that has always been true. And today that is probably exponentially truer as the world is um, so filled with diverse traditions diverse religious practices and schools, many, many spiritual teachers, so many, um, so much wisdom <clears throat> to draw from and to incorporate into your spiritual life. So I'm guessing for each of you watching this today, your, your church, your church within, the place in you where you feel divinity, and humanity meeting, kind of where your human spark comes alive, that part in you that always wants to get a little bit closer, closer to God, closer to other people, and closer to yourself, that that church within you looks quite different from mine, and as it should. Um, because this is part of the great diversity of humankind. If there are any similarities or any um, tr trend lines of connection that I would say probably exist, is that whatever your church looks like within, while it is going to externally look much different from mine, my suspicion is that your church within also speaks in the language of correspondences. When you think of the natural landscapes or the people or the poetry or the teachers or the ideas that, that resonate with you and then help you to come more alive, all of, those, all of those physical things carry with them a spiritual significance. Swedenborg tells us that everything in this natural world actually emanates from the spiritual world. So everything, absolutely everything, has a deeper meaning to it. And when we build a church, when a theological tradition starts to grow or shift, when we paint a painting or when we're drawn to a poet, when we build an altar for ourselves, it will always be particular to us, but also in common with others because we share a common humanity. We share a common universe that we inhabit and all of the, the forms of the natural world that, um, that meet us and that awaken in us the spirit. So there's some words. <laughs> 
but we know that the church within is beyond words. It's that place in us, that soft place in us that is on the journey of regeneration. That place in us that is always saying yes, even when the journey of regeneration is taking us to places that are hard and sometimes painful. That church within is the, the part of us that is coming to know God and self so fully that there is a desire to be authentic and a desire to be fully present, fully loved, exactly as we are. And so in this way, our inner church will also change over time. I know my, my altar, my home altar has not always looked like this. It has looked different at different times in my life. Sometimes I haven't had a, a physical space to, to gather myself in prayer and in meditation. Sometimes my altar has just been a little patch of woods outside, or sometimes it's just the quiet, you know, hum of the train as I ride into work and quiet myself to the divine. We know also in our tradition that worship, while it is something we do practice collectively, and in doing so at church, we gather strength and we live out the call to be in community, we know that worship is life, that we are called to worship by living our lives and by being useful in the world. So probably there are many, many of you that the idea of, of building an altar might feel very foreign or strange. And I hope, I hope that that's true. And I hope that you will not take from this sharing of my own personal um, church, my own church within, and say that yours needs to look anything like mine, <clears throat> because it really doesn't, and in some ways it shouldn't. <clears throat> so I'm going to invite, I'm going to, I'm going to invite you into my altar, share a bit of what it signifies for me, how it describes my understanding of the church within my own self at this point in my life, um, at this time, at this age that I am at this moment. And I share that simply as a means of um, being holy myself as much as I can with you. This is one of the things about the church that is changing and has changed and is such a welcome change to so many. Um, the, the idea uh, that ministers are above or higher or glorified in some holy light and don't share the same human struggles as the rest of us. This idea and the way that it's been practiced in the church over centuries um, has often brought a lot of pain. And a lot of spiritual leaders who have had to project that kind of holiness and impenetrable kind of faith have then acted out in very negative ways, the, their own human temptations. So some of you may feel like this is oversharing, but I think for me, it feels like an act of integrity to invite you in to my church within. <clears throat> and um, because so many of you are so um, generous with inviting me into yours. So welcome, <laughs> welcome to my altar. Now, not surprisingly, I do have my Bible, my open word in the middle. This is a Swedenborgian altar, of course, and by keeping the word always, always open and present, for me, helps me just, just remember how much the Lord is inviting me in always. That, that the Lord's word is not something out there. It's not something that I have to go on a long pilgrimage or trek to find, but it is 
it is something that I already know on some level. And the words of scripture help me to be reminded, help to elicit that knowing. Of course, I have a candle in the middle. <clears throat> I've come to lighting more and more candles as I get older um, in my home. There is something about candlelight, the warmth of the light, so different from those LEDs that we use today. The warmth of the light, the fact that it, it moves with the air, um, something about it just calms me. And um, we know that candlelight and fire is just pretty much the best physical, um, correspondential uh, physical reality that we have to describe God and God's love. The, the heat of the candle, the heat of the fire being that love and the light that that fire brings being wisdom. So I always have candles. I have over here a little picture of Swedenborg who has been such a guide to me um, in coming to understand my part in the world and um, who I feel so blessed to be able to help lead others using the, the wisdom and the vision that he had. Some of you might recognize this one over here. There's Helen, Helen Keller, who over the last five years or so has really risen in my heart um, as a, a true spiritual guide. Um, and I look to her <clears throat> um, for wisdom and I'm excited to, to celebrate her more and more in my life. <laughs> you probably see this cute picture up here of my husband and I, that's, that's when we very first met. Um, and I'm not sure if you're blessed with marriage love, but he is one of my pillars, the pillars of my life and when I am in a dark place or struggling, just knowing that he is there and that he loves me no matter what, it's one of the most precious gifts we can ever have. And I'm so grateful for it. And so I keep a picture of, of, of us together in my altar as a reminder of that great gift. And he is a gift that I, I was given. He was not a gift that I could have ever imagined until God gave him to me. Um, let's see, over here I have uh, Swami Nirmalanda, Nirmalanda, I can hardly ever say her name. She used to be named Rama Birch, and she's a, a yoga teacher. She developed a special kind of yoga called Svarupa Yoga, um, and she was made a Swami maybe 10 years ago. Um, and I have practiced that yoga since 2007, I believe, when I moved back up to Maine. And I actually went to my very first class at the Portland New Church, um, which was an interesting synchronicity that I, I love. And that yoga has been really important to me. Um, you know, as I've already mentioned, we're more than the intellect, we're more than the, we're more than emotion. We also have these, these bodies that we carry around that hold so much of our lives and, um, and as someone who uses her intellect a lot, um, I've found that using my body to release and to connect with the divine is sometimes even more effective because it, it gets me to what is really real and really true, sometimes more quickly than my mind, which can go on many tangents. <clears throat> um, I have a mandala down here that I made during this pandemic. And um, I've always loved mandalas. There's, they're a beautiful uh, meditation tool. My grandmother, who I know many of you know, pass, she passed away this past May and she loved mandalas. She made me a latch hook once of a beautiful mandala. And she told me that she thought that was what God would look like one day when she was to experience that. And right before she died, the, you know, a few months before she died, she was still, <clears throat> Uh, coloring mandalas and those great coloring books she got. She, she pasted her walls with them. So I, I like to keep that there um, as, a, 
and it has all those meanings for me all mixed all mixed together um, over here is a little sketch that a friend of mine did for me my very first year of college um, right before i dropped out actually because <laughs> for me the path of life was a little bit more windy than um than sticking around for a four-year degree but that first year was very meaningful and she she drew this for me um and i i've always loved it so it reminds me of that time in my life but i also you know it's a beautiful figure of a woman and i i'm a woman if you've not noticed <laughs> so i think lifting up images of the feminine for me are really really important especially as i um lead within a a role that has been traditionally a very masculine role um, and seek to to have a sense of um, integration between those two this is a, a little plaque that i received after completing my training in spiritual direction um, at the hayden institute which is actually where my husband and i met and it's a plaque that says summoned or not god is present and i find that a very important reminder it also has a beautiful labyrinth um, in the middle which is always um, such a meaningful symbol to me of the journey of life all the twists and turns and the way in which we are walking and sometimes we feel like we're getting farther away but how every every journey does lead lead back to the center back to ourselves. This is a lovely watercolor um, that a very good friend of mine, Lori Gayhart, gave me. And it makes me think of my friends who love me and kind of love all of me, accept me fully for who I am. Um, but I also think of it sometimes as my, um, especially let's see, this, this figure, she's like leading the way. And I think of her as, as that fiery heart of leading leading the other two figures and as i go through my life i am always seeking to be more um authentic to my real self my the fire within and and to follow that versus the um, expectations or the demands of of others one more picture up here is um this little picture was painted for me by another good friend, the Reverend Jennifer Toffel. And it's a, a picture um, of the view from Holy Hill, which is the, the hill upon which the Pacific School of Religion um, lives in Berkeley, California. And that's where I attended seminary with Jen. Um, and the sunsets up there are just phenomenal. You can see the sun setting right over the Golden Gate Bridge. Um, so I, I leave that there as a reminder of that that seminary time, that time of learning um, that was so important to my, my path um, to this moment today. And then the last thing is this picture behind me that like the light is kind of messing up. But anyway, this is a, a picture. Um, it's, a, it's a print of a portrait done by an Alaskan artist of a mountain range um, in Alaska called Lying Down Lady. And so you can see she's, this is what the mountain range looks like, but they've added in, of course, the face of the woman. And um, many of you may already know that um, one of my most profound spiritual experiences was a, was a very vivid dream um, of, of, of a god, goddess, lying up atop a mountain. And, um, I had that vision and dream when I was in San Francisco. It followed me because it had, there's a similar mountain range um, in Freiburg, Maine, which is where I served a church, the church for three years. And as I was driving to my, I think to my interview to serve that church, that the curvature of the mountain came through the trees as I was driving and it was, it was just like the vision. So it brought me to Freiburg and then to go to Alaska after I married my husband and to find the lying down lady felt like another, um, just, just another affirmation to keep, to keep going, to keep walking the path. Um, 
and I, I try to hold that idea of, of God, goddess, kind of my divine self as lying atop the mountains, kind of grounded in the earth, but still up on the mountains and able to see kind of further uh, vistas. In some ways, that's, that's what I strive to be as a person and certainly as a um, leader in the church. So I think that's it. Um, and then it's just me sitting here doing my best to connect with God. <clears throat> Swedenborg says that the church within, that a person becomes a church when they are regenerated, um, which is always a little nerve wracking because <clears throat> He also said that very few people actually got all the way to regeneration in his time. Although I like to believe we're doing a little bit better today, but it's, it's hard to believe that when there is still so much heartache and so much violence and cruelty in the world. But as is often the case with Swedenborg, sometimes he talks about the church within being uh, a state we reach when we become regenerated. And other times he talks about the church within as um, a reality for all of us as we are on the journey of regeneration. And I certainly will lift that. That seems much more realistic to me. Um, and I find it interesting that he can say both of those things um, simultaneously without kind of dis it almost seems like he can say those both, he can say those two things simultaneously because in some ways they're both true. You know, I think as I've walked this journey um, and as I've watched others awaken um, in the world, you know, regeneration, sometimes we think of it as a state that we, that we earn, that we kind of, we were always working in a direction and that we're on a path kind of accumulating knowledge and wisdom and, and repenting of our sins and that eventually we will kind of get there. Which on some level is true. But on another level, and in some ways perhaps more, a more real level, you know, we are regenerate when we are ourselves, when we are um, fully aware of our divine nature, fully aware that God is at work in us, living through us, that it's not up to us. Um, and when we're fully aware that we are here, not just for our own pleasure and joy, but, but to be a blessing to others and to be a part of the making of a new world. And so in that way, we don't earn regeneration, we, we kind of discover it. And we can discover it in an instant. We can discover it and then we can forget. But usually as we discover something, as we come to know something, you can't really not know it after you've found it. And, um, and I think it's important to, to remember that regeneration that the model of regeneration is something that you walk along a path and you slowly earn can sometimes really get us off the path because it's, it's treating the spiritual life like any other human goal that we might set for ourselves. And sometimes those goals are um, as worthy as they may be when lived from a very human perspective are the source of competition and competition is the source of war and violence and all of the other uh, atrocities that we are so tired of. <clears throat> so I do think it's important to kind of break the chain of, of competition, of earning, because as soon as we are on a path to earn our regeneration, it will be very difficult not to look around and judge the people around us as to where they might be on the path. So in, if instead we think of regeneration as awakening to our real self and our true purpose, um, that awakening can happen any moment. And that awakening can come 
to any person, no matter how they may be judged um, by the external world as a lost cause um, or any of the other ways that we tend to judge our fellow human being. <clears throat> so I would suggest that we are a church insofar as we are striving. Um, striving not to earn and not to gain, but striving to be, to be present in our lives, to be present to the Lord's continual infusion of life, to be present to the things that give us joy, and also to be present to the places in us where we have sorrow and pain. Um, if you think of what happens within a church building, you know, we have marriages, we have funerals, we have worship services, baptisms, you know, all of these rituals are meant to name and mark the transitions that we experience in life. And some of those transitions are joyful and some are sorrowful and most are both because every beginning contains an ending and vice versa. So we are called to do that work co um, collectively within a church building. Um, and the most primary place where we do that work is right here um, every day. And I know for me, where I try to start every day is, is to just be reminded of, of where I came from, that I am not here um, because of my own doing, but that I was gifted life and that I continue to be gifted life. And sometimes I come to this altar angry. Sometimes I come to this altar scared. Sometimes I come to this altar overwhelmed with joy. And this is the thing in church is no matter who you are or how you are or what you have done or what you have left undone, you are always welcome in church and you are always welcome in here, which can be sometimes a really difficult thing to remember when our faults may feel overwhelming, but it's so, it's so vital to remember and that that remembering of the ability for us to be forgiven and for us to be real. That's where the spiritual life really comes alive. So thank you for visiting my uh, a depiction of my internal church. Um, and I pray that this was helpful to you um, in considering how you uh, hold your own church within how you are in the process of becoming a church. What does your church look like? What are the things that, that you love? What are the words or the colors or the images that help you to remember how loved you are and how meaningful and powerful the call of love is? I feel so grateful to be able to be on the journey with each one of you as we do that work, both on our own and then also together. Amen.